From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson here. Ahead today from the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Jim Robb will provide this week's insight on the cattle markets. He'll comment on the latest USDA cattle on feed report and what it's signaling to the market. Then from the National Agricultural Biosecurity Center here at K-State, Ken Burton will talk about three training sessions coming up this week in western Kansas that will instruct emergency responders, veterinarians, and others about the response protocol in the event of a major animal disease outbreak. And on this week's 4-H segment, K-State's Pam Van Horn is joined by the latest Kansan to be elected to the National 4-H Hall of Fame, Jim Bassett. All this and more next on Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global Food Systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, our Monday edition. Thanks for listening as we open up this edition with a look at the cattle market trends, including the latest USDA cattle on feed report posted last Friday. We're visiting now with Jim Robb. Jim, as you know, is the director of the Livestock Marketing Information Center based in Denver. First off, a quick look back at the trades of this past week. The cash fed cattle trade did slip a bit, and the feeder auctions slipped more than a little bit, it appears, Jim. Uh, the feeders were weaker. We kind of run out of steam. The supportive ability of the fed cattle market, especially on the heavyweight feeder cattle, is kind of dissipated here. And the calf market is starting to run into its normal seasonal, as we wean a lot of these calves, seasonal decline. And that's probably not unanticipated. Fed cattle market last week was a little bit softer to steady in most marketplaces. But sort of the underlying better news, Eric, is that the box beef market was up 1% for the week. And we need to look back to a year ago, and uh, we're up uh, fully 10% year over year on the box beef trade and fully 10% year over year on the fed cattle market. Remember last time this particular week, that we traded fed cattle under $100 per hundredweight. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, in some sense, a, a, a little bit stronger market, and the undertone in the wholesale beef market was actually fairly positive last week in face of uh, very large supplies of meat in the marketplace. And that really is the interesting facet that we've talked about several weeks now, that the domestic demand has been able to bear up so well in the face of those hefty supplies. One wonders at what point does that finally break to the other direction. But uh, for here and now, it's a great bit of news. It is, and you know, obviously that export market has been part of this key. And in some sense, the demand for cattle has been a little bit better than the demand for beef. The packers have still aggressively gone after animals, and I think, well, we can see some of that uh, in the latest cattle on feed report, for example. Well, let's get right to that. And uh, what caught the trade's attention, likely, Jim, the placements figure, which was on the upper end of expectations. Well, as it was in the prior month, Eric, it's kind of, uh, as Yogi Berra would say, deja vu all over again. (laughs) Very wide ranges on these pre-report estimates, uh, especially on placements. And then we came in at the upper end of the range on placed, up 13% year over year on a national basis. And I think, as you mentioned, that'll garner the attention of the marketplace. And that's a little bit larger than anticipated in all the states, uh, all the major cattle on feed states. Except for Kansas, you were up 4% year over year, which is right in line with the pre-report estimates. But across the weight categories, in in all of those breakdowns that USDA provides of under 600 pounds to over 900 pounds in terms of cattle entering feed yards, all those categories were up. And we were really up across the U.S. There was really no one place in the country that we can point to as having larger than anticipated placements. But that's what the market will focus on. But importantly, I think, uh, and maybe sort of lost in the shuffle, has been the marketing data. Uh, The marketings were up, according to USDA, 3% year over year. 
but we had one less slaughter day than last year. So daily average marketings were robust 8% above a year ago. And that may turn into be the longer story. We've marketed these cattle as they've really been pulled through the feedlots and into the packing sector. Again, rather strong demand for cattle, maybe even better than the demand for, for beef in the marketplace. And as we look at that marketing rate, it's really had some implications and very positive ones from an overall market structure perspective. The last five consecutive weeks of USDA data, which goes through early October, shows that these steer weights have not increased one week to the next. They bounced around within a pound, and they ran 16 pounds per hundred weight on a dress basis below a year ago in the latest weekly data. So instead of seasonally increasing these weights, the marketing rate has been the factor keeping the weights below a year ago. And uh, that again, that's animals being pulled through this system to the benefit of the overall marketplace. So uh, let's not forget the marketing number, and that probably is the fundamental economic force that has really been fairly positive year over year in our, our fed cattle market and feeding over into calves and yearlings. The overall on-feed inventory came in up 5% year over year. That was a little bit larger than anticipated too, Eric. You know, not out of the range, but again, a very wide range in terms of expectations. Summarizing it, then, we have a market that is finding a way to remain current in the face of these hefty supplies, which is something of an abnormality, Jim. It is, really, Erica. You you know, we've not had weather that has caused these weights to go down. Um, It's really been the marketing system that has pulled cattle through. And that's very positive. And I think we see that in the wholesale beef market And in the year-to-year, even though fed cattle prices have not done much lately to the positive side from a producer's perspective, again, we're more than $10 a hundred weight above a year ago, which does, you know, kind of tell the story. Jim, you acknowledged the latest export numbers from the USDA. Those came out a couple of weeks back, and we might dig a little deeper into the finer points there. U.S. beef export tonnage during August, you note in the LMIC website article, the largest for any month since 2013, July of that year. So really impressive numbers. Has been now. In the summer months, we do export our largest tonnage on a seasonal basis. But those exports have been robust, especially to Japan. Japan has been the very strong market and year-over-year gains that have been uh, uh, almost phenomenal, Eric. You know, there's a, there's a demand profile going on in those export markets for the meat component uh, that's been very supportive. And, uh, and we don't want to forget that uh, dynamic in the current marketplace and as we look ahead. So we're on track now this year, calendar year 2017, to have record large beef export tonnage. You know, the price is also part of the value, but that tonnage being record large is worth monitoring. Mm -hmm. And as we look ahead to 2018, we don't see anything that really changes that dynamic, although the international marketplace is always a bit fickle. You know, the fundamentals in the export profile look good. The world economy is actually growing at a very significant pace on average, as is the U.S. economy. So the fundamental economic growth is driving this really strong export profile that we've had in 2017 and for the beef. Now, on the other hand, and drawing once more from information you've posted on the LMIC website, you're tracking the uh, value of beef byproducts, and those, unfortunately, are falling back a bit. They are, Eric. And in contrast to beef and the exports, uh, the, the byproducts, when we talk about hide, liver, tongue, inedible tallows. You know, we produce a whole range of products besides beef, mm-hmm. and those are really driven by export markets in terms of their value and their price. And, and that's been a surprise with the growing U.S. economy, as we meant, or the world economy, as we mentioned. Uh, these byproducts have not been able to hold together very well, and the real surprising factor has been uh, the value of hides. We export most of the hides in the U.S., but even the other components, uh, liver and tongue, et cetera, that are very dependent on exports have been softer. We actually had some of the lowest values in several years in recent weeks, and we're down on a live steer basis about $1 per hundred weight compared to a year ago. But compared to 2014, we're down over $6 per hundred weight on a live steer basis. And again, this is being driven by the, the hide, which is tied to the leather marketplace. And it's a bit of a quandary 
as to why we've really struggled in the exports of, of hides. Now, we have produced a lot of cattle, hence hides in the United States, and we ran into a big backlog of cattle out of Australia in recent years where they had their drought and very high slaughter levels. So the world, apparently, although we don't have really have data, seems to have a lot of hides in the process or in storage, and we're probably working through some of that. But, you know, in contrast to the meat marketplace, the byproducts, which, again, are very important to the U.S. industry and driven by exports, have really lagged in here. And kind of for some probably supply and demand reasons that are a little bit opaque at this point, and we're still trying to sort that out. So it's hard to tell whether this tide will turn in regard to byproducts anytime soon. It is. Now, certainly the leather markets, et cetera, have been challenged by lower cost synthetic fibers, et cetera. But, uh, you know, that usually tends to move along with the world economy. So we do have some hope here, especially on the hide front, that maybe we'll work through these kind of burdensome worldwide stocks and move that market a little bit up, which would be helpful to cattle prices. Lastly, Jim, the Fed market will be uh, playing off of the USDA's cattle on feed report, which did have its negative overtones. So where do you think prices will generally head this coming week? Well, on the futures market front, after the last report, which this one's very similar to, Eric, we've had a lot of volatility early in the week, and then we settled down rather quickly as people sort of synthesized through it, although you never really know how the traders are going to react to a report that's a little bit bearish, as you said. Look, overall, in the cash marketplace, we seem to continue to move cattle rather aggressively, but we are heading into the seasonal time of year of of retailers, et cetera, focusing on pork and moving towards turkey and other holiday items. So, you know, it's maybe more of a flat market, but uh, we have the chance to move up or down a little bit, and it's really going to turn on how the wholesale beef market unfolds as the week progresses. Very well. Always appreciate your input, Jim. We'll catch up with you again soon. Many thanks to you. It's been my pleasure, Eric. Offering up those comments on the cattle trading trends, Jim Robb. He's the director of the Livestock Marketing Information Center, which is, of course, co-sponsored by K-State and numerous other land-grant universities. This is Agriculture Today. We'll return shortly on the K-State Radio Network. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. You're listening to Agriculture Today. On this segment, we want to brief you on a trio of special training sessions that are coming up later this week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, as a matter of fact, in southwest Kansas. And it's in the cause of preparing local responders to the potential for an animal disease outbreak. This is being conducted and facilitated by the National Agricultural Biosecurity Center here at Kansas State University. The center's director, Ken Burton, is along with us now to tell us more. Ken, your center has been engaged in this activity quite a while now, as a matter of fact, what, a couple of years anyway, formally speaking, right? Yes, that that's correct, Eric. We've uh, been doing trainings in Kansas and Nebraska over about the last uh, year and a half. Remind folks before we go any further about the nature and orientation of the National Agricultural Biosecurity Center. This kind of activity is right in its bailiwick. It definitely is. Our uh, One of our many strengths that we uh, work towards is uh, agricultural preparedness and more specifically foreign animal disease response in an animal disease outbreak. And uh, we work very closely at the state, local, tribal, and territorial levels. Let's look at the training here, and we'll note the locations and dates, and we'll repeat those tomorrow in Cimarron, Kansas, then Wednesday in Liberal, and lastly, the 26th Thursday in Leote, West Central, Kansas. You're uh, asking and inviting locals who might be involved at some level in a response to an animal disease outbreak. For whom are these trainings designed? 
Well, actually, in a rural community, Eric, you know, many people are going to be involved and impacted by a high-consequence animal disease outbreak. And so anybody with an interest would be invited, but we, we most specifically target non-traditional agricultural first responders. And in that group, we kind of include firefighters, law enforcement, emergency medical personnel, animal husbandry, you know, livestock producers, uh, veterinarians, veterinary technicians, extension personnel. Uh, anybody that, that actually might be called into play uh, should a foreign animal disease outbreak occur. And as you're saying, a number of these folks may not be acquainted whatsoever with livestock diseases or animal diseases more broadly, right? Exactly. You know, many personnel are very familiar with emergency response, but uh, the animal disease part of it, uh, they may not have an idea of exactly what their role might be or where they might come into play. When you talk about this, what are the big differences there between a general emergency response and an animal disease incident? Uh, probably the, the biggest difference is the fact that, you know, in, in all hazards type response, uh, those hit and then, you know, like fires, tornadoes, uh, floods, they hit and then you're into the recovery process. In an animal disease response, uh, they hit, but they may be, they might go on for a year, year and a half or even longer. And at the same time, you may have all hazards responses occurring at the same time you've got an animal disease response. So the stress on the responder pool is tremendous. Mm -hmm. Um, As an example, in in Iowa, with their recent high path avian influenza outbreak, in the first six months of their response, they required only over 3,200 responders. And, you know, you take that over... Uh, a year to a year and a half, and it's a tremendous number of people that will be impacted and and be brought into the response. That said, presumably within the training that you'll be conducting this week, one of the keystones to that is coordination of response, isn't it? Definitely, definitely. You know, the the response usually is going to begin at the local level from first recognition. Uh, It'll quickly probably escalate up into the state and federal levels, and the importance of why we want to train non-traditional first responders is so that, number one, they recognize the importance of quarantine, of biosecurity, of cleaning and disinfection, but also they're able to to talk the talk with the federal and, and state officials so that they can give the best information possible so that the state and federal entities can respond uh, in the best manner possible. As you said, you're looking at a diverse body of participants here, and law enforcement officials may never have worked with, say, veterinarians, or veterinarians may never have worked with a firefighter or a first responder. So you're trying to reach out to a lot of people and and string it all together, aren't you? Most definitely. You know, law enforcement is going to be very important in movement control, you know, checkpoints and those types of things on highways. Firefighters are very familiar with hazmat, cleaning and disinfection, so they're going to have a role and need to also understand the quarantines and and the lines of separation and and the the movement effects. So, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a whole different approach to a response issue. In fact, merely identifying an emergency, that's key here too, isn't it? Most definitely. The the, the earlier uh, animal disease uh, can be identified, the the quicker you can bring in response and, and shut it down. How are you conducting the training then? What sorts of methods do you use within these sessions to bring these concepts to the audience? It, it's a combination of approaches. We uh, have lectures on uh, five different modules that we present and from the lecture and then also slides. But then we also have interactions with the students where uh, they actually don and doff personal protective equipment, put it on, take it off, learn you know, why they would be using particular types of personal protective equipment. And then at the end of the day, we kind of bring it all together and uh, put it into a tabletop exercise where uh, we have them do a little uh, role playing where they go in and assume different roles within a rural community and have to talk about what areas would you quarantine? What areas would you stop traffic on? Uh, if you had a sail barn in that small community, how would that impact all of the other movements within the community or other people within the community? Mm-hmm. If the school's outside of the quarantine zone, how do you get students in and out? So it, it's kind of a fun lesson that we bring everything together and have a good discussion. But it definitely mimics a real-life potential incident here then. I'm sure what we try to do. Yeah. Yeah. You've conducted this in other places, uh, most notably in Kansas and Nebraska. What's been the feedback that you've gotten from participants on this, Ken? I think the biggest feedback is, um, gosh, we had no idea that yeah. this would be our role or or the other part of it is we had no idea the impact that it would make outside of the livestock industry Uh, and the other 
you know, the the other businesses and the other day-to-day routines that would be pretty heavily impacted. There's one other component we might mention before we remind folks about the dates, locations, and the potential yet for participating. A lot of these response tactics become even more exacerbated when you're operating in a remote rural area as opposed to an urbanized area. There are distinctions here, aren't there? Oh, most most definitely. You know, your area uh, with animal movement, you know, uh, particularly in Kansas and across the nation, animal movement is massive every day. There's a tremendous number of animals moved. And so the potential for the, the disease response to be spread over multiple counties, states, regions is a probability, not, you know, not a possibility. And so talking about the, the large areas that would be covered, uh, the tremendous numbers of people, and, and uh, just the logistics of getting equipment where it needs to be at the right time is, is pretty massive. Yeah. All right. These sessions coming up tomorrow through Thursday in western Kansas, you have had registration open, and you've already received quite a response, pardon the expression, to that, haven't you? We have. We've, we've got about 120 signed up so far uh, between all three uh, sites. And the cross-section of backgrounds there is impressive, you say? It is. It's, it's very good. We've, you know, of course, the audience we're wanting to reach is the firefighters and the law enforcement and veterinarians and uh, livestock producers but we also uh, have representatives from USDA and then also uh, state and federal politicians. Uh, some of their support staff have, have signed up and are coming in to find out more about how it would impact the communities that they serve. Excellent. Again, the formal deadline has passed, but can you say that if there is somebody out there who's intrigued by this and might want to participate at this 11th hour, you can still likely accommodate them. Sure. We'll, we do everything we could to try and get them involved. And they could uh, go to uh, www.kstate.edu slash NABC and uh, find the information on uh, how they could get to the registration process. We will repeat that address in just a moment. But again, these take place tomorrow in Cimarron at the Gray County 4-H building, Wednesday the 25th in Liberal, at the Seward County Activity Center, and lastly, in Leote on the 26th Thursday at the Community Building at the Fairgrounds there in Wichita County. You can go to this website once again for more information or to register at this late date, kstate.edu slash nabc. Lastly, Ken, you are now contacting other states and developing this training beyond our borders still further, correct? Most definitely, yeah. We uh, we've been making presentations at some of the national uh, meetings and trying to explain, you know, what the ADRT training is and who we're trying to reach. And uh, we've had really good uh, response, and hopefully, uh, we'll be doing some more of this training in the near future. Well, you'll have a busy three days ahead to be sure you're headed to Western Kansas after we finish our conversation today. The best of luck with these. Congratulations on pulling them together, and hopefully they'll all come off well. Appreciate your time, Ken. Thank you very much, Eric. He's the director of the National Agricultural Biosecurity Center, which is based here at Kansas State University. Ken Burton with us and these animal disease response training sessions in Cimarron, Liberal, and Leote. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, respectively. If you're interested, kstate.edu slash NABC. Find opportunities to learn more about being part of a tactical and a successful response to a potential animal disease outbreak in Kansas. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Now, this break. When we return, today's agricultural news headlines come your way. Also, K-State's Charlie Barden awaits with this week's edition of Tree Tales. And again, we'll hear from the latest Kansas inductee into the National 4-H Hall of Fame during our 4-H segment. So please stay with us here on the K-State Radio Network. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension.
Agriculture Today resumes now here on the K-State Radio Network. Again, we're glad to have you along. Eric Atkinson here. Today's agricultural news headlines for you now, courtesy and part of DTN. Congressional trade lawyers and attorneys from private firms in Washington have begun meeting informally to come up with ways to challenge any decision by President Trump to pull out of the North American Free Trade Agreement. The private attorneys and congressional aides say the contingency planning is in the early stages and most don't want to discuss the matter publicly while the talks over NAFTA are continuing. But with NAFTA negotiations having hit their most difficult stage so far in the round that ended this past week, and with the president repeatedly warning that he will pull out of the pact if trading partners can't agree to U.S. demands, these talks over how to respond to a withdrawal have taken on a new urgency, according to those involved. The president would almost certainly face legal challenges if he took steps to negate the 23-year-old pact with Canada and Mexico, according to lawyers, particularly from industries which have become dependent on free trade across the continent. A professor of law out of Vanderbilt University, Tim Meyer, said that we would definitely see industry groups in court with the full support of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce the day after such a notice would be sent. The chamber has called upon the administration's proposals for NAFTA as highly dangerous and could be expected to challenge any unilateral withdrawal. The U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer declined to comment. His predecessor, Michael Froman, who's now a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, said Said there's a vigorous debate about what would happen if Congress opposed a withdrawal, but he said he believed that a lot could be done by executive action. Monsanto is suing Arkansas regulators for banning its version of the herbicide that's drawn complaints from farmers across several states. Monsanto asked a state judge to block the Arkansas plant board from enforcing a rule it adopted last year that prevents dicamba products from being used each year from April the 15th through September the 15th. The panel approved the restriction specifically on Monsanto's Extendamax herbicide in November. Several months later, the state adopted a wider temporary ban that included other dicamba products in response to farmer complaints. The plant board last month rejected a petition from the company to allow its herbicide to be used. The 18-member board, which is made up of various members of the agriculture community, is holding a public hearing on the new restrictions next month before the plan goes to lawmakers there. Monsanto said it may amend its lawsuit to challenge the new ban if it's ultimately adopted by the state. Now, this lawsuit comes a week after the Environmental Protection Agency announced it had reached a deal with Monsanto, along with BASF and DuPont, which also make dicamba herbicides, for the new voluntary restrictions for the use of the product. Under the deal, dicamba products will be labeled as restricted use beginning with the 2018 growing season. Trends of increased crop production via precision agricultural technologies are expected to continue. However, there is an obstacle to this growth, as we hear in this report from the USDA's Rod Bain. Nick Tindall of the Association of Equipment Manufacturers says precision agriculture and the farm machinery that comes with it is so high-tech, what with its average 6 to 10 onboard computers and more computer code than the space shuttle. We expect in the next 100 years to see more productivity gains from the manipulation of big data than we saw in the last 100 years from mechanization. And he explains what is currently the biggest obstacle involving that increased productivity. That future where we're collecting data points on every single plant and every single field from the time it's planted to the times it's harvested and manipulating that to create real-time actionable data is only possible if we have wireless connectivity in those fields to upload telemetrics data, to have the transfer of that soil information to your agronomist. A challenge coupled by creating wireless and broadband services that provide both high-quality and affordable connectivity for producers and their equipment. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And a calendar reminder for you about an event taking place a week from this Friday. Advances in cover crop research at K-State will be featured at the 2017 Agronomy Field Day. That's Friday, November the 3rd, taking place at the Ashland Bottoms Research Farm south of Manhattan. There will be a focus on understanding the role that cover crops play in water quality, in weed control, soil quality, and more. Specifically, there'll be discussion of using cover crops for weed suppression by K-State's Anita Dilly. 
Improving soil quality with cover crops. Deanne Presley to take on that. Protecting surface water with cover crops and uh, fertilizer management. K-State's Nathan Nelson will address that. Soybean yields and cover crops. Ignacio Ciampitti. And 10 years of cover crops in a no-till wheat sorghum soybean rotation covered by Craig Rosabohm. Lastly, cover crops and nutrient management, nitrogen management specifically by K-State's Peter Tomlinson. This field day will begin at 9 o'clock in the morning, Friday the 3rd, wrapping up about 1 o'clock. There will be one-hour tours concurrent during the morning starting at 9.30. No charge to attend, but pre-registration required by October the 30th. Uh, contact Troy Lynn, 785-532-5776 at K-State for pre-registration, 785-532-5776. Now it's on to this week's edition of Tree Tales with K-State Forester Charlie Barden. Charlie? If you have driven through eastern Kansas recently, you may have noticed woodland areas with a dense undergrowth of bright green shrubs with red berries growing wild. The berries are clustered around the stem, and the leaves will hold a bright green color right through November. These are not from native shrubs, but from one of either two species of bush honeysuckle, Amer or Tartarian, which can get 6 to 20 feet tall. This landscape shrub has become a serious understory invasive throughout the Midwest from eastern Kansas through to Ohio. Many states even have it on their noxious weed list, though here in Kansas that designation is usually reserved for crop field or grassland weeds. Bush honeysuckles are also noticeable in the spring as they put out leaves much earlier than most other trees and shrubs. These leaves also stay green much later in the fall, as I just mentioned. This long growing season gives it a competitive advantage over our native species, and the vigorous growth can shade out and take over a woodland understory, reducing the number of native wildflowers, other shrubs, and even desirable tree seedlings like oak and walnut. So if you want to promote native plants on your property, then you may need to control bush honeysuckle. Honeysuckle seedlings can be readily pulled when the soil is damp. Chemical control is needed for larger infestations, as cutting alone will only result in vigorous resprouting. Foliar applications of glyphosate, such as Roundup, in fall works well. This can be done late after the leaves have fallen off most native plants so that just the bush honeysuckle absorbs the chemical. Immediately treating cut stumps with Tordon RTU or concentrated glyphosate is also quite effective. Several studies have shown basal spraying with trickle pear, such as Garlon, not to be effective, while basal application with 2,4-D and picloram seems to work well using an oil carrier to penetrate the bark. Always follow all label instructions whenever using pesticides. You are listening to Tree Tales. I'm Charles Barden, a forester with K-State Research and Extension. Thanks, Charlie. And this is Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. Up now on this part of Agriculture Today, our weekly segment on the Kansas 4-H program. And it's our distinct pleasure to visit with the latest inductee from Kansas into the National 4-H Hall of Fame. The ceremonies took place just a few days back in Washington, D.C. Along with us now is Pam Van Horn. She's a research and extension 4-H specialist at K-State who has escorted our guest to the studio. Pam, a bit about the Hall of Fame recognition program. Kansas has been well represented here in recent years. That is so true. The Hall of Fame, as we know, has been established for 15 years now. And Kansas has been very fortunate that we have 15 laureates into the Hall of Fame. The National 4-H Hall of Fame is where 4-H enthusiasts, whether they were professionals, financial supporters, or extension staff, they can be volunteers, but they are honored for their contribution to the 4-H, the large movement of 4-H across the nation. And they are nominated by the state staff? How does that work? Each state has an opportunity to nominate a candidate. So we have had a good pool of candidates across the nation to go through this vetting process. 
Well, without any further ado, let's meet the latest inductee once again from Kansas, the 2017 class recognized at the National 4-H Youth Conference Center on October the 6th. Jim Bassett will be a familiar name to those of you acquainted with the 4-H program here in the state. Jim, congratulations to you, first of all. Thank you very much, Eric. Tell us about how you became indoctrinated in 4-H as a youth in northeast Kansas. I started when I was eight or nine years old as a 4-H member at our club at Dover, Kansas. In that period, 4-H was a very important part of our community and of my individual life. And as you noted in your presentation upon receiving this recognition, you learned some core values right then and there within your 4-H experience. I sure did. I can definitely state that learning those values uh, have stayed with me throughout my my business career. And what are those to list them out? Well, you're kind of giving me a test there, Eric. <laughs> right. the, uh, the ability to recognize that your work is a team effort, that things are, are going to be done through through cooperation and and finding minds that are, are more astute on particular subjects than, than my own, and also the, uh, the ability to set goals and measure performance against those goals. All of that is ingrained in the 4-H program. And those have all served you well in your professional as well as personal life. You they sure have. Tell about your career path so folks will know a bit more of your story, Jim. Well, following my education at Kansas State, I started as a sales trainee with with Cargill and stayed with that fine organization throughout my career for 38 years. Those principles that I talked about being generated in the 4-H program played an important role in uh, any of the success I enjoyed was that company. You had a broad array of successes in an executive capacity for a number of those years. Fast forward to recent years and present day. Again, even in retirement or semi-retirement, however you describe it, you have stayed very much in tune with 4-H and involved in 4-H on the uh, board of the Kansas 4-H Foundation for one, but uh, many other activities as well. And you still maintain that the values that you grew up with and gained from 4-H are applicable this very day. Absolutely. I, I, I know of no other organization that can do more for youth than the 4-H programs, which are so dependent upon the role of, of volunteers. And you, to that point, have been championing that volunteer initiative here in, in Kansas and with 4-H, encouraging those who... Uh, could contribute to the program to step up and be dedicated volunteers. I know of nothing more important than growing our volunteer ranks and providing them the the resources they need to implement the 4-H programs through 4-H clubs with uh, with youth. There is a great opportunity and at this time in Kansas we have approximately 10,000 volunteers serving youth and about uh, 60,000 youth impacted by those volunteers each year. We are committed to growing those numbers and feel that by doubling our volunteer ranks, we will also double the impact of 4-H on our youth in Kansas. From your experiences as a volunteer, the rewards of serving in that capacity are are tremendous, aren't they? If you have a feeling for, uh, for youth, you're going to be very well rewarded. Jim, want to ask you what this recognition means to you, that is, being elected to the National 4-H Hall of Fame. Well, I think it probably recharges one's batteries and uh, makes you want to do, do more. I can uh, recognize so many people uh, across the state that do so much for 4-H, and if we can continue to find resources to uh, to support today's volunteers and tomorrow's volunteers, our youth in Kansas will, will have a significant advantage over kids who are not so privileged to have the 4-H adventure. Very good. And Pam, we'd bring you in to close out and to just to reflect on Jim's selection to the National 4-H Hall of Fame. 
I think Jim is a wonderful candidate. He has been really significant in um, changing a tide in the um, fundraising from the Kansas 4-H Foundation, uh, kind of encouraging programmatic efforts across the state that we can enhance our educational program to our youth. He does see that the outcome is the youth, but the vehicle is the volunteers to reach that. So he is a great asset for Kansas 4-H. Indeed. Jim, the heartiest congratulations on this well-deserved recognition. We appreciate you visiting with us for a moment right here. Thank you. And Pam, thank you as well for being along with us. All right. Thank you. Accompanying Pam Van Horn, Research and Extension 4-H Specialist at K-State, the latest Kansas inductee into the National 4-H Hall of Fame as a member of the 2017 class. He hails from Dover in northeast Kansas, Jim Bassett, who is longtime supportive of 4-H and its initiatives in developing youth in this state. That's this week's Kansas 4-H feature. Thanks for being along with us. We'll be back here tomorrow this same time. Hope you will as well. Until then, Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.